Uh, for those maybe who came later, just a brief introduction. My name is Andrei Stumpf. I'm a PhD student uh, under the joint supervision of uh, Dr. Norman Kerle at IDC in the Netherlands and Dr. Jean-Philippe Mallet at the University of Strasbourg. And this talk is going to be about the use of active uh, machine learning techniques for object-oriented mapping of landslides. And the motivation for uh, this research is that we are frequently facing very large triggering events uh, by earthquakes, uh, like here on the left in, in China, or you can also look at the uh, recent history of uh, Rio de Janeiro State, and you frequently find uh, very heavy rainfalls, typically in December and January. Some might, of you might be still aware of the images that uh, went through the media in January 2011, uh, triggering about 3,000 uh, landslides. So. Uh, Mapping those features in time is a very challenging task, and we want the landslide inventory maps uh, for the future hazard and risk assessment. And if we could do the mapping just very quick in time, then uh, they, those maps could also be useful for disaster response. In principle, there's enough data now available. We have all the uh, very high-resolution sensors, uh, but there are still no methods available which can be used to extract that information in time. And I know, for example, a PhD student who worked on the mapping of uh, the 60,000 landslides in Wenchuan, China, he spent about one year of his uh, PhD for drawing all the polygons. So. Uh, that's something you would probably like to avoid. And uh, if you want to develop an object-based approach for such kind of mapping, uh, or I think for many tasks, you are mostly faced with at least those three questions. That's which segmentation, which features you should use, and which threshold values to pick. And going through this from the uh, bottom to the top, uh, in, my, in our work, we try to here try to avoid uh, the threshold values by going for a supervised approach. That means you need training data. And uh, well, then probably an interesting question is which training data, which samples you should use, and this is what active learning is about. And once you have the training data, you can use also the classifier, and this is our case, this is a random forest uh, algorithm to do some feature selection, to choose the right attributes for your objects which are relevant to your task. And uh, about the segmentation, uh, we did some experiments in our e experience for a supervised approach uh, over segmentation. A fine segmentation is uh, mostly the, the better starting point because you can merge objects afterwards, but it's relatively hard to get them apart than uh, during the classification. So, uh, just a few words about the random forest algorithm, since this is re really at the, yeah, the base algorithm I use. Uh, this uh, goes back to the work of Leo Breiman, who uh, wrote about this in a very influential paper in 2001. And he advocated the idea uh, to use, well, of a supervised uh, machine learning algorithm, that means you need some, some training data. And he advocated the idea to uh, construct from the training data not only one classification tree, uh, but actually do uh, sampling with replacement from the training data and uh, recreate uh, bootstrap samples. And each of the samples will a little be a little bit different. You construct from each of the samples a classification tree. And in the end, you let the, all the trees in that ensemble, which is then the forest, uh, vote for the right class membership. And what you typically can observe, as you add more trees, classification trees to your ensemble, uh, the er error rate will typically go down. And another interesting feature is that during the construction of the trees, during the bootstrap sampling, you, uh, for each tree, you usually have 33% of the data which is not considered for the construction of that individual tree. So you can use that out of, it's called out of back sample, you can use it later on for estimating error rates and um, making uh, estimates of the variable importance. So uh, I will uh, first show you like the typical, let's say, passive learning processing chain. Uh, I go very quick, quickly through, th through this, this, this since this is already published work, just to show you the idea and how we uh, try to enhance that. So we would start with a fine segmentation and compute for all of the objects. They are really very small here. Uh, compute for each object the number of features, texture measures, which are uh, uh, related to the local flow direction, difference to neighbors, 
uh, topographic variables, shape, color, you name it. And we are, depending on the images, we are working with 50 to 100 features. The problem is then mostly a, a, a priori, you don't know which of those features are actually valuable for your classification task. So, but once you have your sample, you can use the random forest algorithm to do a feature selection. I will not go too much into the details here, it's just uh, the important part is more or less here. It's, uh, there's a small sample, a small part of the sample which is out of back. And you can send this sample uh, through the individual classification tree once with all the features intact. And the other time you randomly permute one of the features and you observe uh, uh, a difference in the, in the accuracy. I mean, you, you know the class membership of this already, that's your training data. Uh, so you can uh, observe the difference in the accuracy and according to this you get an, an estimate of how important the feature that was just permuted is uh, for the right classification. So you get an estimate of the variable importance. Then you rank all, that, all the features according to their importance and you do a stepwise backward selection and, and you choose the model which gives you the lowest error rate and that's your set of features which you want to use. Um, another important thing is to consider as you use a supervised approach is uh, that most classifiers that applies also for support vector machines, neural networks and so on, they are uh, uh, prone to, to class imbalance. That means if one of your classes you consider is much bigger than uh, the other classes or other class, then the algorithm will pr typically be biased towards the majority class. And for, for lens lights, that's exactly the case. We have typically, we have a, a less, uh, a minor part of the landscapes actually affected. So the uh, lens lights are the minority class and the algorithm would be biased towards, uh, towards the non-affected area. So we, you would get an underestimate and uh, what is here in the box is a kind of resampling scheme, again based on, on the training data. We take here 20% of the data for training and you do a resampling and you change the class imbalance in your training data uh, iteratively. And while you're doing that, you, you monitor on the out-of-back sample, you monitor the development of users and produce accuracy. And at some point you will see when you get the right, just the right balance, then uh, that's where you want to be, that's where the users and producers accuracy balance. So you use that, uh, that class balance to train your final model. And you can, and in this case we used here 20% of the data and we test that model on 80% of, of the remaining objects which are unlabeled. And what we get from it, we tried this on different images here, GOI, QuickBird, uh, aerial images and uh, Iconos from four different uh, areas with different types of lens lights to see if that really works generically and we get uh, very balanced uh, users and producers accuracy and depending on the scene complexity uh, accuracy is between 73 and 87 percent so that's very promising but uh, a problem is still here is actually that 20 percent of the training uh, of the data for training uh, still a lot if you consider that this training data should be, uh, should be uh, uh, distributed equally over the map. So you would, like all over the map, you would have to label a lot of segments, which is still a lot of work if you consider that that's, uh, uh, tiny segments that you just saw. So we would like to further reduce the number of, of uh, samples that we actually need. And in the machine learning community, this is uh, known as something which is called active learning. Uh, some of you may, he may have heard of that. And the idea is uh, to not collect all your training data at the very beginning, but to uh, collect at the, at the beginning just a tiny bit, just enough to train a model. You have your labeled training set, you train a model, and then you use the current state of your model to decide, to let the model decide which uh, which training point to pick next to acquire a label for it. So you give, so you give the model control over which, uh, over which uh, sample it wants next and you give it back to the user which could be somebody in front of, uh, of an image and make an interpretation 
maybe one, f oops, sorry, maybe one fine day, even people working in the field. And what is expected from this, and this is really works, that you, uh, as you add training samples to your your training set in several iterations, you uh, get a much steeper lear learning curve compared to random sampling, because you choose the let's say the important samples. And there are several ways to do, to do that. One is called a query by committee. And this comes somehow naturally with a random forest algorithm because you have a, you have a committee of trees. And uh, while well, you can do with that ensemble of classification trees, you can do a prediction. Uh, but at the same time, you can say something about the uncertainty of the classification. That means if all the classification trees in the model uh, disagree pretty much about a sample, then this is probably the very interesting sample that's uh, where you want to acquire the next label. So translated to our, to our uh, problem of mapping landslides, we have here a pre and a post image of, the, of an area uh, close to Nova Friburgo uh, here in Brazil. Uh, we do a fine segmentation, extract the features, and we start with some initial training data, train the model, make the prediction, and for each of the samples, we calculate the uncertainty of, of the classifier and we pick next the segment which uh, the classifier is the most uncertain about. We send it to the user. Well, I have to add probably that we, of course, we don't have all the time a geomorphologist sitting in front of the machine when we do an experiment. So we take a reference inventory and we just pick the label here from the reference inventory. And what we get from this uh, are this kind of curves. You see here on the x-axis the number of iterations or the number of objects that, uh, are, that are added to, to, to the model. And you see that uh, after a few iterations you already get to a classification accuracy of about 70-75%. And if you compare it to the points random sampling, the same number of objects sampled randomly and labeled, uh, you see that there's really a huge difference in the in the accuracy with a, with a, a significant uh, difference in the labels, in the uh, number of labeled objects you require. So this would be about 400 iterations. You can also plot this against the processing time. And then you see that it still takes a lot of time because if you go segment by segment, then you would have to retrain the model in each iteration. That takes time. So uh, one th uh, way to avoid this retraining in each step is to not uh, query only one segment each time, but to query in batches. That means to query 10 or maybe even 100 uh, segments in each run. And uh, we thought also that if you look at the, at the map, this shows here where the queries are, then this is the reference inventory, and this is shows where the algorithm uh, asks for a label then you see that they are actually somehow spatially clustered. And this is not considered as all. They are like some of them are, you would, you would have to, uh, 400 times, for 400 iterations, you would have to label each segment individually, zoom in, zoom out, visit the same location twice. So this is pretty much focusing on, on feature space while it ignores uh, geographic space. So we thought we should maybe go for something which is a region-based approach, not picking individual segments, but show the user the region which is the, which is the most uncertain and the most valuable for the, for the classification. So that is uh, shown here. You uh, go start from the first region. You give the user a marker tool where you can mark just on the map. And with the marker tool, it's much quicker to, you, you, to, to label you with one click on the marker, you mark uh, 10 to 100 uh, segments if the, if the segmentation is very fine. You feed the model, you uh, calculate the uncertainty, and uh, then you actually go by a sliding window and you have to define that, the, 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 your window size, and you look on the map for the region, and now please stay with me, not with the highest uncertainty, but with the highest standard deviation in the uncertainty. Why that? Because if you look for a region where the classifier is very uncertain, well, all the samples will be uncertain, but they may well be, look all the same. It could be that your whole region is just a, a field, so they would all look the same. And uh, this is something which, which the literature also talks about, that you have to enforce uh, diversity also in each, in each run. So by looking at the standard deviation, 
of the uncertainty, we imp try to implicitly force uh, uh, a query which also uh, encourages uh, uh, diversity in the, in, the, in the training data. So, come on. No? Doesn't want any more? Time is up? Already? No. Oh. Okay, then uh, I'm just switch to the end. Um, uh, this is then the result that we get after 20 iterations, and with that uh, active learning query, we can uh, we get to an accuracy about to, of about 75%. Uh, if you consider the labeled data as well, you get up to 81%, and we only labeled 5% of the training area, uh, spatially focused. So in like in 20 batches of that small areas, so uh, we get a better accuracy uh, with a reduced labeling time and uh, a reduced number of iterations. So that's it. Okay, there's still some things to do. One final thing I want to po point out is that we use R software for the spatial libraries of R software for doing the, the learning algorithm. We still use eCognition at the moment, but on the long term we would like to get to a fully open source system and uh, the CNES, the, the French Remote Space Agency, they uh, really push an uh, uh, open source development project for uh, uh, sp uh, image analysis, which is a, a combining, uh, uh, comes together with a Pleiades satellite. So we would like, to, we are working also on an integrated system to have a GUI and in the background having the R software to uh, produce some useful uh, interface. Thank you very much. <laughs>